I'm now going to make a video that's about the derivation of centripetal acceleration. I've already given you in the previous video what the magnitude of centripetal acceleration is, and now we're going to go through in some detail where this comes from. I think that this derivation is a little confusing to follow since it doesn't seem particularly intuitive and it requires a lot of geometric reasoning. So I'm going to try to go through it in more detail than the book does, and hopefully that will make it a little bit clear. Keep in mind that I'm never going to ask you to derive this yourself on a test or anything like that, but understanding this process will help you with your overall problem-solving skills, and hopefully by watching this and thinking through it, you can reinforce the mathematical tools that you already have. So our starting point is that we know we can define our acceleration as the change in our velocity with respect to time. Now I'm specifically writing it this way because we've said that in the case of uniform circular motion, the magnitude of our velocity vector isn't changing, but the direction is. So we do in fact get an acceleration vector here, but for this calculation we only are trying to get the magnitude. So we have to put the magnitude sign on the outside of the derivative of the velocity vector since we know all we're interested in here is actually the change in direction. So this is a nice starting point, but what we want to do is actually express this in terms of v, where you can think of this as the tangential speed, and r, where that's the radius of the circle that the object is traveling in. So we need to understand how the direction of our velocity vector is changing. We'll need to look at some geometry to do that. And we need to replace both parts of this initial equation, this derivative, with other variables. This isn't really a helpful form right now. And the technique that we're going to use, and this is the part where it might seem like it's coming out of nowhere, is to actually relate everything back to d theta, a tiny change in angle, since this is circular motion, but we're going to hope that d theta itself cancels, that we don't want d theta in our final answer. But it's completely valid to introduce a new variable in the middle as long as it cancels at the end. So this is the approach we're going to take. We're going to look at each part of this, the top and the bottom. We're going to try to relate it to d theta, hope it cancels, and try to relate it to the variables of v for speed and the radius of the circle. Now, one thing to know, and I'm not going to go through the detailed geometry here, but the angle between our initial and final velocity vectors is the same angle that our object has transversed. So that's something we're going to be using in the geometry, um, and I'm not going to go through proving that per se, but hopefully you can see why that is true when this is perpendicular and that is perpendicular. That's kind of the way to see this. The first thing we're going to look at is the change in velocity. So by definition, the change in velocity is equal to our final velocity vector minus our initial velocity vector. So that's always true. That's basically a definition. But now what we need to do is get it to that, that change, that dv, right? So we don't just want to change. We want that differential change. So what we're going to do to get dv here is to basically say that this is equal to the magnitude of our change in velocity vector, and all we're doing is taking the limit as delta, just macroscopic change, becomes the differential change. So that's all we're doing. So we're taking two velocity vectors as we would for capital delta change, but then we're actually going to make them differentiably close together, which is reflected in that d theta that we have. So now here's where some math comes in, and I think this is a little tricky to follow. So for circles, we've said that the arc length is equal to r, the radius of the circle, times theta. The circle we're actually looking at here is the circle with a center here, and that actually looks like this. Well, if that was a circle. And so the radius of the circle here is actually equal to the magnitude of my velocity. Okay, so what we're doing is effectively looking at this, which is now our arc length. Now, the argument about whether that's a straight segment, which dv is, or whether that is a curve, which s, arc length technically is, as long as you make theta small enough, it doesn't matter. 
So S is going to be equal to our dV, theta is equal to our d theta, and R is equal to V. So what that means is that we can just use this equation here, right? So S becomes dV, and again, our center of the circle is here, and that's just the little arc length. That little arc length there is S or dV. R is actually V. And again, that's not the circle it's traveling in here, but a geometric circle that I'm looking at to understand my change in velocity vectors. And then theta here is my d theta. And again, the d theta in the circle it's traveling in is the same d theta as the opening angle between these two vectors. Now we need to relate dt to d theta. And again, the goal is to get rid of dt. We can have d theta, and otherwise we want v for speed and the radius of the circle. So we've said that the speed is going to be equal to, in general, for uniform circular motion, circumference over period. But we can also just say that it's equal to whatever little arc length is traveled over the amount of time that it took. So this is a, a completely valid definition of velocity, since we're just considering a tiny little path here, and then the tiny amount of time that it took. So that's our nice starting point. What we then do is, again, think back to this arc length. But now we're not using the geometry of vector subtraction. We're not worried about this part at all for this. We're just worried about the part over here. So in this case, we're going to take our s and we're going to differentiate it. r is going to be constant, right? The radius of our circle is not changing. So our change in arc length is equal to r d theta. What does this mean? Well, we get to put this on top, right? So this just goes on top here. And now we have a new equation for speed in terms of r, d theta, and dt. But we, what we actually wanted to do was remove dt from our centripetal acceleration equation. So we need to rearrange this. And that leads us to this equation for dt in terms of three things that can be in our answer. So at this point, we're almost done. We have found a representation for the change in velocity vector, where again, this is the magnitude of the change in my velocity vector. It isn't just a change in speed, so be careful about that. And we have that in terms of the speed itself and the change in angle. We have what, how dt relates to the change in angle, and we can now go back to our definition of what acceleration is and plug these in. So we plug this in on top, and the dt goes on bottom, and we're left with this form. And what we're going to do, the, the v is actually, you can think of this as kind of a fraction divided by another fraction. The v is going to pop up on top. The d theta on top and the d theta on bottom are going to cancel. So we're left with v squared, so that's the speed that the object is traveling at squared, divided by the radius of the circle the object is traveling in. So that is the derivation of how you calculate centripetal acceleration for a uniform circular motion.